Professor Heichengreen, you said in your keynote to European Dialogue 2017 that you are in this moment more optimistic about uh, the situation and uh, the, um, the state in, in Europe than uh, about the situation in the US. Is this only a sign of a deep frustration caused by the Trump presidency, or, or do you really see progress in Germany, uh, in, in, in Europe? Sorry. I do see both. Um, my big worry, like many people's at the moment, is about the course of U.S. economic policy, which is uncertain, about the course of social policy in the United States, which is likely to aggravate the inequality problem and about the political re repercussions in my country. Having said that, things are getting better in Europe. Economic growth is picking up. The European financial system is slowly but surely healing itself. The European Central Bank is talking about the that there's no longer a need for quantitative easing and it's prepared to begin to shrink its balance sheet. So I think all those things are good. Most fundamentally, economic growth heals a lot of wounds and the fact that Europe is growing a bit better now I think will be good from the point of view of political stability and therefore policy stability. So we are um, quite optimistic regardless of Brexit, of the uh yeah, popular search that we have seen in, in the different countries uh, in the last years? Brexit is a big problem. It's a big deal for the UK. It's not as big a problem for Europe, for the rest of the EU. I do see big problems coming down the road for Britain, but not for the remainder of the EU and, and the Euro area. Um, Europe's condition is there's always a European election and where there's election there's political uncertainty. Um, that problem is not going to go away. This year it's the French and German elections and next year of course it will be the Italian elections. I do think it's important to recognize the, the positive signs. There was a very close call in Austria but it turned out okay. Mm -hmm. the, outcome in the Netherlands uh, was not unlike what one would have expected in prior elections except for the rise of this one very extreme racist party. Mm -hmm. The outcome in France is uncertain as we speak, but it well could be, it will be if you believe the betting markets, uh, the election of a political centrist. So. Europe has political institutions from proportional representation with a threshold in the Netherlands, uh, the need for a constructive vote of no confidence in Germany, um, a two-round presidential election system in France that I think make for governmental stability, relatively stable coalitions, and hope for good political outcomes. So basically the political system in Europe is stable but the euro zone and the euro system is still flawed. This is what this is your message. I'm I'm not arguing that Europe has perfect political systems, mm -hmm. but I think the political systems in a number of important European countries are relatively resilient to the threat coming from a political renegade and extremist coming from outside the established party system. None of that is a guarantee that uh, the mainstream parties and their leaders can get mm -hmm. together and move forward with fixing the, the flaws in the Euro area. Part of the problem and the only part that I can contribute to is trying to offer a clear diagnosis of what those flaws mm -hmm. are. My view is that uh, the Eurozone urgently needs to do four things. Number one, create a normal central bank, and I think it's made a lot of progress in the last five or six years mm -hmm. in creating a central bank that, so that is um, trying to hit a, a symmetric inflation target and recognizes its responsibilities as a 
lender of last resort. Number two, uh, finish its banking union and progress has been made to start the banking union. Europe is about halfway and it needs to, complete, to cross the finish line mm -hmm. there. Number three, more controversially, I think that uh, responsibility for national fiscal policies needs to be turned back to the member states. You can't run fiscal policy out of Brussels and none of the attempts to do so from the stability pact mm -hmm. to the fiscal semester to the two pack to the mm -hmm. six pack have worked. And number four, for governments to regain their fiscal room for maneuver, you need to remove debt overhangs where they exist to mm -hmm. restructure unsustainable debts in countries like Greece. Mm -hmm. um, my message, therefore, is that Europe doesn't need the Eurozone doesn't need more Europe, it doesn't need less Europe, mm. it needs a combination mm. of the two, depending on whether you're talking about monetary policy and policy toward the banking system, where more is needed, or mm. fiscal policy and uh, public debt, where the answer is less Europe. But for the moment being, I'm afraid that Mr. Schäuble, the finance minister in Germany, does not really agree on the first, the third and the fourth point. Uh, he is regularly criticizing Mr. Draghi and his normal, more normal uh, monetary policy. He wants more centralization on, on the budgets in the Eurozone and he is uh, totally opposing any kind of debt, debt relief or debt solidarity uh, and transfer union, like he called it. How do you see uh, Mr. Schäuble's uh, work and do you think that there could be change after the German election? I'm, I'm certainly uh, familiar with Mr. Schaudel's views. Um, I, I disagree with some of them. Uh, someone pointed out to me earlier today at our meeting mm -hmm. that it's not clear that Germany would sign up to the bargain that <laughs> I had proposed. And my answer to that is that uh, Germany would get two valuable things in return. Number one, it would finally be able to put to rest doubts about the uh, permanence of mm -hmm. the euro area. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem is that people are always wondering about the permanence mm -hmm. and wondering about membership and there's all this noise about Grexit and Brexit mm -hmm. and Frexit and <laughs> so forth. So to finally draw a line under that uh, issue would be uh, of great value to Germany. Secondly, Germany doesn't like being in the business of having to oversee and manage and intervene with Greek fiscal policy mm. and Greek debt policy and so forth. And the, the benefit to Germany of renationalizing fiscal policy, having a real no bailout rule at that point, um, if Greece mismanages its debt, Greece alone bears the consequences. Making that viable would require disconnecting sovereign debt from mm -hmm. banking systems. But uh, I think German voters and German leaders would appreciate not having to worry about Greek debt on a weekly basis and not having <laughs> to worry about the permanence of the euro area. Mm -hmm. You mentioned progress is in uh, Europe and uh, catching up, uh, that the, the uh, European economy is catching up. Um, on the, at the same time, we have uh, growing worries about possible um, international uh, tax and, and uh, economic wars after the beginning of the Trump uh, presidency. What do you think, uh, how, how big is this danger? Because the, um, the general impression is that uh, President Trump uh, yeah, is uh, now softer than the campaigner Trump. Is this? So are, are the, the, uh, is, is the danger really decreasing or in what, which state are we now? It is a very serious danger. You need only recall that the United States is 20% of the global economy. So what U.S. economic policy is and does can have major consequences for Europe and, and the rest of the world. Will Trump turn in the direction of protectionist policies 
and label Germany or Europe currency manipulators and slap on across the board tariffs. We don't know. It's still possible. Um, it does appear that the balance of political power within the White House is swinging at least modestly from mm. the extremists and the protectionists toward the moderates and the free traders. But it could as easily swing back. And one can still imagine that a president frustrated about his inability to push through health care reform, income tax reform, corporate tax reform, a big infrastructure package could resort to some kind of flamboyant trade policy initiative, that being the one thing the president can do unilaterally. So I'm hopeful it won't happen. I'm worried that it still could. What can uh, European leaders or European countries to, to, uh, do to um, uh, limit this, this danger or decrease with view, for example, at the German trade surpluses, which are, yeah, are sort of, uh, you know, which, are, which are targeted very, very directly and very rude? Well, number one, German policymakers can continue to educate the American president who has a learning curve, and mm -hmm. Mrs. Merkel, when she went to Washington, educated Mr. Trump about the fact that Germany doesn't run its own monetary policy, but it's part of this thing called the Euro area. Number two, I think uh, German policymakers and German business can talk to American business because American business would oppose, by and large, a big protectionist initiative and Mr. Trump listens to American business. Number three, Germany can diversify its trade as it's been doing and not put all its export eggs in one basket. And finally, uh, I do think the fact that Germany has such a large external surplus is something the country could constructively address with its own policies. A country has a big external surplus when its savings exceed its investment and there are productive investment projects in areas starting with infrastructure and education that I think Germany could pursue and if it could tell the US, look, this is what we're doing now to begin to correct our external surplus, that would diminish the danger of a trade war but it would also be good for the German economy because uh, these productive investment projects would help to sustain growth, address worries about inequality within the country and so forth. One thing that uh, has struck me when I, when I heard your keynote was at the beginning that you said that you were, were somewhat a fan of co-determination and uh, European uh, trade union movement. This is quite uncommon for an uh, American economist, I suppose. Suppose, um, yeah, could you just a little bit? Well, I've studied um, the Wirtschaftsbunder and uh, uh, the German economy off and on over the years. I think uh, Germany's successful growth in the, in the third quarter of the 20th century and even today rested on, in, in a way, a bargain between labor and the owners, the capitalists, the people who owned the capital about uh, cooperating in reorganizing production and in, in return for that cooperation, uh, German workers got an assurance that they would get a fair share of the results. And one thing that reassured them was they were in the boardroom to monitor and participate in the uh, decisions that management was taking. I think you need a, a number of things in order to get shared growth. Um, and one way to pursue it, I think, is through uh, co-determination. Uh, co-determination may not be ideal for maximizing the profits of, of a firm in the short run. But it, it's one way I, to go, I think, to uh, sustain that cooperation and get the vocational training programs and the other things that um, <clears throat> have served the German economy for one pretty well over, over the last half century. 
And you think it still works in the 21st century in the globalized? Well, no, no, no set of institutions works perfectly and, and they have to be updated for the 21st century. But yes, I think they can be made to work and remain part of the, uh, the German growth recipe even now. Thank you very much.